thank you all for joining us. My name is Kimberly Kay, and I'm the Director of Operations and Editorial Development with the Legal Insurrection Foundation. And I'm really excited to be able to host this event where we will be discussing um, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Uh, again, just as if y'all are just joining us, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A. If you want to chat with people who are also um, in the chat room, you can do that using the chat function. Professor Jacobson will give us an overview. That's how we're gonna start. We'll give us a brief overview. Then we'll turn it over to Andrew and we'll save about 45 minutes for question and answers. This is being recorded. Uh, we do respect your privacy. So if I do read one of your questions, I'm not going to use your name or read your name out loud. Um, for those of you who have donated, I can't think, uh, tell you how much we appreciate that and how much we thank you for your generosity. We are a very, very lean organization. I can't, I can't stress enough how lean we actually are. And every dollar that we receive in donations, which we, we take very seriously, um, we put right back into programming and right back into research and right back into things like this because we want to ensure that the content that we bring to you remains free of charge and that events like this are free of charge. Um, so we really appreciate that. If you would like to donate and have not done so, I am going to drop the link. If you feel so moved to do so, we would appreciate that. Um, but without further ado, I am again, really excited about this event. I'm really excited about the outcome as well. And I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Jacobson, who is the president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation and is also a clinical law professor at Cornell Law School. Yeah, hi, thank you, Kimberly. And um, Kimberly put this together on very short notice, so we appreciate that. Um, and thank you also to Andrew for being here. And I have no illusions. I know he's the reason you've come. He's the person you wanna hear from, but I feel obligated to give you a little bit of my perspective on things. Um, I can't really remember, and we've covered a lot of trials and Andrew's covered a lot of trials at Legal Insurrection. I'm not sure I can remember one that got the attention this one did, that so captured the nation. Uh, and I'm going all the way back to the George Zimmerman case. That certainly captured the nation, but there's something about this that I think has touched a bigger political nerve than the other ones. This is all wrapped in with the political conflict we're having, with the anti-Trumpism, with uh, Trump derangement syndrome, with wokeness, with um, toxic personalities on MSNBC. There's something about this one that seems to be different to me. And I think it's a sign of the time of what we're going through. Uh, Andrew covered it really better than anybody. And to his credit, his coverage has gotten all sorts of accolades. Um, he's been on many big shows. And so we're really thrilled that he's able to be here with us tonight um, and for Legal Insurrection readers. Andrew's history with Legal Insurrection in many ways, I think, is tied into how this paradigm of racialized, manipulated court cases has developed over the years. Really, it may not be the first one, but in my mind, looking at where we are now, I always go back to the Zimmerman case. Uh, the Zimmerman case in the shooting of Trayvon Martin was where the hashtag Black Lives Matter developed. And they developed a methodology of exploiting cases and ignoring the facts of a case in order to create a narrative. So some of the things, and it's by no means all of the things, is you immediately have it denounced as a racial shooting. You have George Zimmerman, who is of mixed race, called a white Hispanic. Nobody, I think, had ever heard of that term before because the media needed to call him white. And you had a, an incident which was not racial at all but the media, media created it out of whole cloth with NBC editing audio tape of the 911 call with George Zimmerman seemingly saying, there's a guy, he looks suspicious, he's black. Well, what they left out in the middle of that was the question he was asked was, there's a guy, he looks suspicious. The 911 operator says, is he black, white, or Hispanic? George Zimmerman says, He's black, he looks black. 
They cut that middle part out to make it into a racial case. They release photos of Trayvon Martin when he was much, much younger and he looked like a, a little child, but he was almost a man at that point. He was 17. He was very, uh, uh, you know, very strong. Um, and there was a lot about, but that is how it developed. And what developed was that that was a shooting of a black kid because he was wearing a hoodie and because he's black. And I remember the protests, even at Cornell, of people wearing hoodies in protest. But Andrew uh, covered that case for us. And those who, many of you probably don't know how that came about. Um, I was writing some pre-trial things and Andrew was putting some comments in the comment section. And I said, oh my God, this guy really knows what he's talking about. He knows a lot more than I do. And so I reached out to him and I said, hey, would you be interested in covering this? And it really was a big event for legal insurrection. Yeah, a lot of coverage, a lot of people watching, and Andrew did that every day live and really established it. But anyone who watched that trial knew, while you can never guarantee what a verdict would be, it was highly, highly likely that there would be a not guilty finding. The only ones who didn't think that was likely were the media types and the activists who didn't care about the facts. I'm not going to dwell on the facts of the Zimmerman case, but it was an overwhelming case of, of self-defense. Um, so that's where we started. And over the years, that has given way to what is time. Almost every year, it seems there's some case where a racial narrative is pushed where there is no racial narrative. Another one that Andrew was involved in for us, and I also covered the riots too, was the shooting of Michael Brown. Now, there never was a prosecution. There, there never was a trial because there never was a crime committed by the policeman. And that was really after the Michael Brown shooting, the fabricated narrative was created of hands up, don't shoot. And that all the evidence point to that never having happened, that Michael Brown was not shot while he was had his hands up saying, don't shoot. He was shot after he punched a policeman in the face and tried to steal his weapon and then made a second charge at the police officer. And that's when he was shot. Local prosecutors investigated it, found no crime committee committed. Eric Holder, Barack Obama's attorney general's office examined it as to whether there was a civil rights violation and found there was no uh, it was an acceptable use of police force, no ma racial motivation, et cetera. Yet that was the racial case that is the defining case. And it was the Black Lives Matter hashtag was created after the Trayvon Mon Martin shooting and the Zimmerman case. But the Black Lives Matter movement, as we know it now, the three women who formed it, was formed in the midst of the Ferguson riots. And that is now the dominant political force. And that is something which we have covered. And it points to something which I'm gonna to get to and we're getting to is we're like in a post-truth world. Uh, our politics around these incidents are driven by things that have nothing to do with the truth of what happened. And the truth doesn't matter. One thing I know drives Andrew crazy and I just saw him tweeting about it or writing about it is the concept that George Zimmerman was told by the 911 operator not to leave the car, but he did it anyway. And I can't tell you how many people I've heard say that. To this day, they say it. A Harvard Law School professor just wrote about it. Um, and that never happened. We have the audio tapes. George Zimmerman was already out of the car, but it's a, a non-truthful thing that has become embedded in the public consciousness, just like hands up, don't shoot. And that's what we have now uh, and we've covered many other cases and Andrew's covered a bunch and he doesn't always come down on the side and we don't always come down on the side that, you know, there was a justifiable use of force. There are cases where it wasn't. There was one I think we referred to as the loud music case where somebody shot up a car in a gas station because he thought the teenagers inside were playing music too loud. Um, and there are other ones. So we look at the facts and we are driven by the facts in reaching our conclusion. Um, coming to the Rittenhouse case, we have another one of these things that they're still saying that he carried an illegal weapon across state lines. Okay, people who pay no attention to borders, who actually 
want our country not even to have borders. All of a sudden, the sanctity of the border between Illinois and Wisconsin takes on some huge meaning. But we all know that's not true. The gun was in Wisconsin. It was lawful for him to possess it. That's why the judge threw out the charges, probably should have thrown them out six months ago, but waited until just before it got to the jury. But that is something that you hear repeated all the time now. And, and so, you know, anybody who watched the Rittenhouse case and followed Andrew's coverage and paid attention to it would come to the conclusion that there's, other than an irrational jury, uh, other than a runaway jury, this was almost like the classic self-defense case. Somebody is pointing a gun three feet from your head after having chased you down and you shoot him before he shoots you. But he wasn't or, the kind of person who could shoot anybody. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and it's really quite amazing um, because, I mean, I'm sure maybe there's a physiologist, if that's the right word out there. Um, there are photos of him, even after his bicep was blown off, still grasping the gun. Um, the, the perpetrator, um, or, you know, someone's beating you about the head with a skateboard. I mean, think about that. I mean, that's classic self-defense. Somebody who has threatened to kill you is running at you, trying to grab your gun while cursing you out. I mean, th this wasn't even close, but if you saw the media coverage, you would think that this was a guy who just traveled to Wisconsin to shoot up a peaceful rally. OK, this wasn't a peaceful rally. It was a full blown riot. OK, and you had and the worst of the rioters, based on the video I've seen, were the Antifa types who um, were not even black. OK, and so you have this other narrative where you have a lot of liberals now announcing, I just found out the people he shot weren't black. I thought from the media coverage, this was a guy, a white guy, a white militia member, a white supremacist who shot up peaceful black protesters. And we know now. That, that's not true. So, you know, kind of the history of the cases we followed is this post-truth world where narratives are created. You can't shake them because they become embedded in the public mind very early on. And once it's embedded, you can't shake it from most people. And so that's kind of my takeaway here is that this case has now turned into a racial case, even though it's a white guy shooting three other white guys. OK, yet if you watch MSNBC and I try not to, but I do see the clips. OK, if you watch CNN, if you see what people are tweeting, you would think this is a case about race. And it's not. It's a case about against that self-defense. And that's what I really want to take away from it. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew to give his observations. And we've already got 41 questions. I think that's a record. <laughs> so we're going to leave plenty of times for questions and answer. And I'm going to stop talking for now, at least. So I see a lot of the questions are quite specific, uh, and I'm happy to answer those. Uh, I'm sorry, Kimberly, I, I interrupted you. No, that's okay. I just, because it's my job, have to remind everyone that this is purely observation and that nothing being discussed here is in any way legal advice. If you have an issue, please find a competent attorney that deals with the issue you are facing. That's for it. sure, for sure. If you're not paying me, I'm not your attorney. That's how that works. <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of very specific questions here, but just kind of a first an overarching view all the way from the George Zimmerman days through the Michael Brown case, all these other cases we cover cases where there's literally there's zero legal merit. There's zero evidence inconsistent with self-defense where the state knows they have to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's it's not even close. And the only other explanation can be political motivation. And the political motivation is generally not hard to find. In the case of George Zimmerman, the prosecutor there, Angela, Angela Corey, was running for re-election. Her position was an elected position. She was going to lose that election. There were marches against her. A large part of her demographic in her election area was um, made up of African-Americans. She had done some very unpopular prosecutions of African-Americans. She was prosecuting, at the time, Marissa Alexander, uh, who was presented by the media as a uh, domestic abuse victim who'd merely fired a shot into the air. Uh, in fact, she fired that shot inches past her husband's head, uh, and there was no evidence he was doing anything to warrant being shot at. But that was an unpopular prosecution. She had prosecuted a 14-year-old uh, African-American boy for murder. Um, and if you look at the facts of the case, it, it was murder, uh, but it was an unpopular prosecution. 
So there were marches against her in the streets. She was going to lose that election. And then the Zimmerman case came along and this was not her judicial district. They, the, the, the prosecutor in the district retired rather than prosecute George Zimmerman. That's how clear a case of self-defense it was. So they had to bring in an outsider. Angela Corey was happy to volunteer to prosecute George Zimmerman. And once she started prosecuting him, instead of there being marches against her reelection, there were marches by black organizations for her reelection. And she was at the front of those marches. So it completely turned around her political fortunes. And in fact, she won that election. So when people say, well, you know, Zimmerman was acquitted, Angela Corey, the prosecutor lost that case. Well, I think it depends on, you know, for certain values of loss. I mean, she lost a trial, but she won the important fight, which was her battle for reelection. So did she really care? I mean, the trouble is for these prosecutors, it ends up being a win win. Either they win the trial, of course, and they get a conviction and it, it all seems like the right thing to do, or they lose the trial, but their social community rewards them for having fought the good fight. They get the reelection, they get the promotion, they get the gig at CNN as a legal analyst. It's all upside for them. There's no downside. These people are never held accountable, no matter what they do. And we'll talk about some of the real malfeasance in this uh, Rittenhouse trial. But even in the George Zimmerman trial, they did things like the only reason they were able to charge him with second degree malice murder in the first place was they claimed he had racially profiled Trayvon Martin. And the entire trial, I'm waiting to see this evidence of racial profiling. And there was never any. I mean, that was completely fabricated in the charging instrument just so they could meet the popular demands to charge this person with murder, because otherwise there was there was nothing close to that. So they just they just make up these allegations in these informations, these charging documents, these criminal complaints to drag that person into court, usually for a murder trial where they're looking at spending the rest of their life in prison without possibility of early release. And the very premise of the prosecution is false. There's no evidence to support it. Then in Zimmerman, they did things like they had they had evidence that would be very favorable to the defense. It was a bunch of photos of Trayvon Martin doing non 12 year old things, because, of course, he was being presented in the media like he was a, a 12 year old boy. He was he was a very robust 17 year old engaged in a lot of violent and and apparently criminal behavior. Um, and he had like a lot of 17 year olds in that lifestyle, had photos on his uh, iPhone or smartphone, whatever it was, holding guns, smoking weed, doing all kinds of stuff that 17 year olds that were part of an image they did not want presented. They wanted the nice, clean 12 year old uh, presented. So what the prosecution did was they they burned all this evidence onto a DVD and they gave it to the defense. But of course, it's thousands of exhibits, thousands of photos. Thou and so what they also do is they provide a summary list, a printed list, a report of everything that's on the DVD. And of course, when the when the defense gets this, they're a small staff. They don't have time to look at thousands of things. They look at the list and see if there's anything interesting that they you know might be concerned about for the trial. Well, the prosecution left all that evidence off off the list. And so suddenly mid trial the person in the crime lab who produced this DVD realized what had been done. He actually ratted out the prosecution, got himself a lawyer, ratted out the prosecution. And the defense was outraged. They told the judge, you know, they, they, they hid this evidence from us. And the state said, oh, well, not really. I mean, we gave it to you. You just had to look for it. You know, we buried it under so much other stuff. But if you had looked for it, you would have found it. We saw the same kind of stuff here in this Rittenhouse case with this drone video, for example. Uh, first of all, the notion that the evidence fairy leaves this critical piece of evidence for the state's <laughs> narrative of guilt in the middle of the trial, when the person who produced that drone video footage was actually on the witness list weeks before. So what his purpose was supposed to be weeks before the state says they ever knew the drone video existed is beyond me. But they admit it late. And then when they finally do provide it to the defense, it's a degraded version. It's a low resolution version. And folks are for, for the purposes they were using it for, the fine detail of whether or not Kyle Rittenhouse had provoked this confrontation, um, it's they may as well have had a 12-page document and given the defense three pages of it, and then said, well, we gave you the document. <laughs> well, no, you didn't give us what you were actually going to use at trial. And the reason they engage in these machinations is because it works for them. It worked in the Michael Brown case. This is Most people don't know this, but the reason there was no prosecution in the Michael Brown case is because the local prosecutor got that case went to the grand jury, and he did something that prosecutors are not obliged to do. He presented the grand jury with both sides of the story. So in a normal grand jury proceeding, the state presents its narrative of guilt. It's not obligated to present the defense. That's not part of the threshold for the grand jury. The defense will get presented at trial. If it gets to that, 
all the prosecution is obliged to do is present its narrative. Well, when they do that, they, they get an indictment. I mean, that's why we have the expression, a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich, because they are only hearing one side of the story. And if you only hear one side of the story, it always sounds compelling. But in the Michael Brown case, the prosecutor said, no, I'm going to tell them both sides. Here's the evidence in favor of guilt. Here's the evidence in favor of that being a lawful use of force, the shooting of Michael Brown. And of course, when they heard both sides, the grand jury refused to indict. So there was no criminal trial in that case. But guess what happened to that prosecutor? He had been prosecutor in that town for decades, which is how in in the old days, that's how it worked with prosecutors. There were normally old guys who'd been well-established members of the legal community forever. And they just had that job forever, for decades. That was this guy. Well, the next time they had an election for prosecutor, guess what happened? George Soros came in with a bucket load of money for some young uh, upstart attorney got him elected DA. So the, the old district attorney who did the right thing, he lost his job. And he was replaced by a guy who immediately said, I will reinvestigate. I will reopen this Michael Brown case. We will have action here. And he got elected with that George Soros money. And within six weeks, he'd looked at the evidence and he decided, well, you know, we're not actually going to do anything after all, because <laughs> there is no case to be made there that that was an unlawful use of force. But the point is when the prosecutors do the bad thing, they get reelected, they get advancement, they get promoted uh, both professionally and within their social circle. They get those CNN gigs. And when they do the right thing, they lose their jobs. So how do you think that incentivizes prosecutors generally? People will follow their incentives and that's how they're, they're being culturally incentivized. This is a growth industry right now. These cases are not going away. There are gonna be more young prosecutors, relatively young, like Binger, who see nothing but opportunity and bringing these unjust prosecutions in these cases. Nothing's going to happen to Binger. I'm, I will bet a hundred bucks nothing happens to Binger because nothing happens to any of these people. And I know people will bring up Michael Nifong. Folks, that was 20 years ago. If this happens once every 20 years that a prosecutor's actually held accountable, that's not enough. They should be held accountable every time they do this because they've done it thousands of times over that 20 year period. We only hear about the, the big cases, but I can assure you, Binger doesn't operate differently in smaller cases. He, this is the kind of prosecutor that he is. So we have a real problem. Until we have some kind of mechanism to hold these people responsible, I see zero incentive for them not doing more of this. Um, now, there, there are things that might be done. So, for example, there's one state, Washington state, has a statute that says if you're prosecuted in a use of force trial and you claim self-defense and you're acquitted on the grounds of self-defense and the jury actually has to fill out a separate form saying they believe self-defense was proved uh, by a preponderance of the evidence. But if they fill out that form, the state has to reimburse you for your legal expenses. Well, every state should have that because these are not cases where the state fell marginally short of proving self-defense. This is These are cases where the state was never close, never could be close to disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, they're just egregious overreaches. So what we really need is something, I mean, I would call it Kyle's law. We need a Kyle's law that holds these people accountable when they bring these politically motivated cases, when, it's, when it becomes apparent that they're nowhere near the threshold of disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt that they need to be at to win a case. And until we have a mechanism in place to hold these people accountable for these egregious overreaches, it's nothing but win-win for prosecutors to bring these politically motivated cases and they will not be going away. All right. I think I just talked for like 20 minutes, so I should give somebody else an opportunity to say something if they wish. Yeah. I mean, one thing that the, I never really saw, I mean, the prosecution essentially proved self-defense on the prosecution's case. And I think it was obviously, you know, uh, risky to put, Kyle on the witness stand. I did see an interview with the lawyers afterwards, and they said they had run two mock trials or mock juries, one with him testifying, one without. And they felt they had to put him on. Nonetheless, and I'd be curious on Andrew's take on this. I mean, if the defense had just put on maybe a couple of those technical experts, but had not called Kyle, what would there have been to the prosecution case? It seems like while they didn't really damage Kyle through his testimony, they bought themselves some time. They, uh, a lot of the things that seemed to happen were because the case dragged on another two or three days. And I'm just wondering 
if when the prosecution rested, maybe the defense said nothing. Um, what I, I'm I'm thinking the result would have been the same, but with less risk. What's your thought on that? I, I think that's probably true. So I have some uh, perhaps unfair insight into some of those uh, uh, mock uh, jury trials they did prior to the real trial uh, to answer these kinds of questions. And it's true that uh, when they did the the mock jury trials where Kyle testified, he did better, but it was not much better. It was very marginal uh, and the outcomes were mistrials regardless. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it was worth the risk of putting Kyle on. And what I mean by that is anytime you put a, a criminal defendant on the witness stand, you really have three risks that you're dealing with. One is that, well, most criminal defendants are criminals. So they have a long criminal history that'll all come out if they're on the witness stand. They're just witnesses like anybody else. Then they can be impeached by their past convictions and so forth. So normally you can't put your client on the witness stand because they're criminals. Uh, we didn't have that problem here. So that risk was off the table. But there are other risks that are inescapable. Um, one is that the a pro a professional interrogator, and that's what a prosecutor is, a professional interrogator on cross-examination will get your client to, they will be snide and insulting and sarcastic. And after, you know, they had Kyle on the witness stand on cross alone for three and a quarter hours. Uh, that they will break them and there'll be some kind of outburst in court from the witness, from the defendant on the witness stand that will look terrible uh, to the jury, that they'll never be able to forget. This is something they saw personally, an outburst of anger, for example. Um, that can be catastrophic all by itself. And you, as a lawyer, defense lawyer, you have no control over that, right, if, you're, if your client's going to explode. Um, so that's an unavoidable risk. Another unavoidable risk is a good prosecutor, and say what you will, will about Binger. I mean, I think the guy is a dirtbag. But he's not stupid. Uh, he's good at what he does. Um, and a good prosecutor, or for that matter, a good criminal defense attorney, um, everything they're doing in the trial, it, they're not just having conversation with these witnesses. They have a mission in mind. They have a closing statement they want to give. And they've kind of framed it out, like you might frame out a house, right, when it's half built. And now what they need from that testimony is they need all the building materials that go into completing that framed house, they need all the bricks that go in there. They need to they need to finish the construction. But the finishing of the construction has to come from the evidence, has to come from the testimony. So they're not asking general questions uh, unless they're just engaged in some uh, deception at the moment. Uh, they're asking questions to get specific words out of that witness, the specific words that are the building blocks they need to frame out, to finish that house that they started constructing. Everything they're working on is to get those words they need to be able to say in that closing argument. And when you put your client on the stand, that's what the prosecutor is doing. He wants to get, he'll ask the same question 14 different ways until he gets the exact pattern of words that he's looking for. And of course, your client's not a professional interrogator. They're not a lawyer. So they don't know that the four words they just said are going to be incredibly damaging when the, when the prosecution does its closing. Um, and that's another risk you take. And, and the risks of outburst and the risks of providing the golden egg to the prosecution by accident um, are unavoidable. And so the defense here incurred those. Now, I don't think it happened. I don't think Kyle hurt himself on the stand. I think he did fine. In fact, I think he presented quite, quite well. I think he did an amazing job for a 17 year old being interrogated for three and a, qu a quarter hours by a professional. Um, but you didn't know that was going to be the outcome. The risk was much, much higher than that. And I don't see what they got out of it that was worth the potential downside. I think they walked away without any meaningful damage, but they got lucky, I think. And so I, I would not, I think, I think this defense made a lot of decisions, um, a lot of tactical decisions, a lot of strategic decisions that they did a lot of things I would not have done. So I, I've said in the past in the George Zimmerman uh, defense, I thought that team, Mark O'Mara and Don West, were perfect. They were perfect. Maybe one joke Don made could better have been left out, but they were 99.9% .9 perfect. It was an amazing criminal defense. Now they should have won. They should have won George Zimmerman's acquittal because he, there was no evidence inconsistent with self-defense, but they could have, they could have screwed it up and they could have lost and they could have ended up with a conviction that didn't happen in large part because their defense was perfect. This defense was far from perfect far from perfect. I was very disappointed in this defense uh, for the most part. And, uh, and fortunately it didn't, it ended up not hurting Kyle. He got acquitted anyway. Um, but the standard should not be 
hey, we did kind of a middling job and our client, you know, he, he won. I mean, if they hadn't had this perfect evidence, all this video, uh, the, the, the state's witnesses, the state's witnesses testifying consistent with lawful self-defense. As often happens in these cases, by the way, this happened in Zimmerman too. Every day I watch the Zimmerman trial, this, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the state to present this evidence that will disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. And they bring up witness after witness after witness, and either the witness's testimony is ambiguous on the key issue or it's favorable to the defense. Because in these politically motivated cases, there is no legal merit for a prosecution. So they can't present that because they don't have it, but they have to present witnesses. So the ine inevitable result is that the witnesses they present are actually favorable for the defense. And we saw that here again in the Rittenhouse case. Uh, yes, when we got to, when, when the state rested, there was no reason not to have just a directed verdict right there. I mean, th there was no way they had come close to disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. No reason this, the defense should have been obligated to present any defense at all. But unfortunately that doesn't happen really in modern courtrooms. We don't enforce things like, has the state actually met its burden? We don't even, we don't even have real probable cause hearings. I mean, in America, this case, this case should never have gotten past a probable cause stage based on the evidence that was actually available at, at the time. Keep in mind, they didn't even have the drone video back in the day, right? Supposedly they didn't discover that until uh, midway through trial, although I think that's a lie. Um, so I guess I talked enough that I finally lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing I was thinking is it, it almost seemed like the prosecution at the last minute was going to pluck victory from the jaws of defeat with this provocation issue and the drone video. And I don't feel like the defense fought that hard enough. They should have been screaming so loud about that that you know, the judge was telling the bailiff to carry them out of the courtroom and they didn't. Right. I almost feel like they kind of like let it in. So a, a common a, a, a common theme of this entire trial that I found amazing was the uh, the prosecution would put forth some inane argument to the judge, a reason evidence should be admitted or not admitted, whatever the case might be. And they might have uh, one or two talking points for or against whatever their argument was, but they wouldn't say them one or two times and stop. They would repeat those two talking points 40 times to make it seem like they actually had 80 reasons why their position should be favored. And then the defense would provide one or two responses and quit. And it became obvious to me that this is a judge who, you know, some judges, when they ask for motions, hey, all right, we have an issue in contention, some some issue of the law. Uh, you prosecution, you defense, write up a motion tonight. I'll read it in the morning when you give it to me and I'll make a decision. And one of them writes a 100 page motion and the other one writes a 10 page motion. That judge doesn't read them. He weighs them. He holds one in each hand and the heavier one, he just presumes must have the, the greater legal authority. They did this in Zimmerman because I read some of those state motions mid trial and they had citations to 20 cases. And if you bother to look at the cases, they were not on point. They were nothing but filler. But of course, a judge doesn't have time to do that in the middle of the trial. So he just weighs them. This judge wasn't weighing paper documents, but he was weighing length of argument. And if the state was willing to argue the point for 20 minutes and the defense did it for two minutes, the state won. And the defense should have realized this on day one. Like you, Bill, if I was on that defense table, they would have had to drag me out of that courtroom before I would have stopped talking on any issue of contention in that case, because that's obviously what the judge responded to. It, it's not necessarily the appropriate way to do it, but if the other side is doing it and winning, you better believe I'm going to do it for my client. Nope, oh, we lost Bill. You're muted, Bill. Okay. Yep. Why don't we go to questions? Because we have a lot of questions. I'll let Kimberly do the first sorting of these things. Yeah, we have so many questions, y'all. I'm going to do my best to get through as many as we can, um, as we discussed at the beginning of the program. Uh, so we do have one that says, do you believe the judge would have declared a mistrial with or without prejudice if the jury returned a guilty verdict on one or all counts? No. Nope. This, this judge loves juries. He loves the, the principles of juries. Uh, if they had returned a guilty verdict, that would have been and I don't believe for an instant that he would have uh, gone against their will. Uh, I mean, listen, he had plenty of reason to declare a mistrial with prejudice before it ever went to the jury, and he didn't do it. Uh, he was hoping, I believe, I'm speculating, of course, now somewhat informed, I think, speculation, but he was hoping that uh, he'd get an acquittal and all these motions would be moot and he wouldn't have to deal with them. Although, interestingly, he did finally grant the motion at the end. 
um, when it couldn't really make a difference in the outcome, but might have implications, I would hope, I would like to think might have implications for the professional future of Binger, uh, Prosecutor Binger and Krauss. Um, I'm not sure I haven't looked, I haven't looked into that closely to see what the implications might be. I, I certainly hope they're negative for the prosecution. They, they earned it. Um, but no, if they had come back guilty, he, Kyle would have been uh, cuffed up right there, taken off to jail and then uh, be prepared for sentencing, sentencing for the rest of his life in a cage without possibility of early release. That's what he was looking at. The least, the, the, the least charge he was facing was good for 17 years. Just incredible. Uh, next question, likelihood of federal charges. Zero. I mean, there's no grounds for it. The FBI already investigated this case and there, were, there was there was nothing, nothing for them to do. Uh, you know, the, 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 this whole federal thing, it's not like the, the feds automatically get a second bite at the apple like the state courts had. There has to be some particular federal nexus. And you often see it with police cases because there's specific uh, federal statutes. Uh, Section 1983 is the most well known, but there are special provisions because police officers are acting as agents of the government where you can get um, the federal courts to become involved in the process. But of course, we're not dealing with that. Kyle was not a cop. Um, there's, no, there's no racial component. I mean, there's, there's no grounds here. Uh, he didn't carry a gun across state lines. I mean, there, there, there's nothing that would raise a federal nexus in this case. So what they're doing, the people, the politicians, of course, uh, who are talking about this um, are the ones on the left who their side was conviction. They didn't get it. Their side, you know, feel salty about it. And they're trying to, uh, you know, don't worry, there's still a chance. There's still a chance. We can still look at the federal. That's all nonsense. That's just that they did that with Zimmerman, too. I mean, you know, the Barack Obama, Eric Holder, Department of Justice had to say, well, there was no reason to go after Zimmerman. They had no basis for it. Uh, that'll be the outcome here, too. OK, uh, why wasn't the jury sequestered? Because uh, uh, jurors hate to be sequestered and courts hate to sequester them. I mean, uh, I think they should have been sequestered. Um, but I think this judge didn't, he grossly underestimated the kind of media and political pressure that would be brought in this case. You know, folks like us who watch these trials have for a decade or more, uh, we get it. It's like you're thrown into a, a, a furnace. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of attention and pressure and media and, and, and all of this. But if you're a local judge in Kenosha, I mean, he, he I, I heard the judge talking during pretrial hearings before. He was like, oh, I'm not worried about it. I've had high profile cases before. And I'm thinking, huh, I don't think you've had high profile cases like this before, sir. Um, and of course, he hadn't. And you could tell, by the way, he would he would talk from the bench about how how upset these media reports got him. I'm like, well, first of all, why are you reading that? I mean, you shouldn't be reading that if it's going to influence your conduct in court. Uh, and aren't you a grown man? I mean, don't you? <laughs> This is just what these people say. You, you can't take it seriously. But he was quite personally upset. Um, and so I think if he if he had to do a trial of this intensity again, he would sequester the jury, I expect. I would like to think. But he didn't know. He was completely blind. He thought he was prepared and he completely was unprepared. Um, so the, the standard is there's no sequestration. Uh, jurors, you know, they hate being jurors anyway. How many of us try to get out of jury duty, right? And then when you're on the jury, they're going to make you stay in some dumpy hotel. Uh, they hate it. You can't see your friends, your family, anything. Um, and so the courts hate it as well. So, so sequestration almost, almost never happens. It ought to happen in certain high profile cases. And arguably it ought to have happened here. The other thing, by the way, today, and of course, this is a different world than when I started in the law or when Bill started in the law, but to sequester a juror today, really, you've got to take their phone from them. And people can't live without their phones. I mean, they become neurotic if they don't have that phone with them all the time. They're, they're disconnected from the Internet, and their social network completely. Um, it, it's I mean, it's almost like a human rights violation. So the ability to in the old days, you could just tell people, hey, when you go home, don't watch the six o'clock news tonight. So for half an hour or an hour, they had to not watch TV. And that's not so hard to do. But today it's like, well, you can't be on the Internet. You can't be on your phone. You can't people. You can't be on your tablet. People can't do that. We, we don't live without these devices anymore. So real sequestration is an, um, even a much greater hardship today than, than than it would have been you know, back in the day when we had TVs with three stations. So it just doesn't happen. OK, a lot of questions about his <clears throat> his AR-15 and whether or not he'll ever see it again. Well, I think they should have given it back to him on the courthouse steps, frankly. I mean, he's not guilty of any crime. It, you know, he's entitled to possess it. 
Uh, I, th- I think that would have been awesome if the judge had ordered Prosecutor Binger to hand them back the rifle and the magazine with 22 rounds left right there on the courthouse steps. But of course, I'm not king yet, so I don't get to make those kinds of decisions. Um, technically, it's not his, right? So in the case of George Zimmerman, they actually did give him his pistol back. In fact, I was interviewed for, for German news television. And one of the most shocking things they found about the entire Zimmerman case was that he got his gun back. And I was like, well, why wouldn't he? I mean, it's his. <laughs> he didn't. He just got acquitted, so he didn't do anything wrong. Uh, and then, of course, he raffled it off later, which drove the left even uh, madder than it was uh, and got a lot of money for what actually is a pretty uh, inexpensive pistol. Um, so but technically, this AR is is not Kyle's to begin with. I did hear that a, a gun rights organization, uh, I think it's Gun Owners of America, has uh, bought him an AR following his acquittal. So I think he'll be just fine. I think he'll be hip deep in ARs pretty quick. I imagine so. Okay, what feedback um, have we heard from jurors, if any? Um, I don't know that we have, and I wouldn't believe any of it. I never believe jurors after the fact. Uh, we never know what really happened in deliberations, except for the outcome. And uh, often if the outcome is politically unpopular, especially if someone was a holdout, which tells us their their social class is, uh, their social community would have been against the acquittal, for example. Um, it's very difficult for them to go back to their community because everyone knows the verdict was unanimous. So they know that person also voted for acquittal, right? So they have to go back to their community. Everyone knows they voted the unpopular way or the wrong way in the context of their community. And you get a lot of heat. You don't get invited to the cocktail parties. Uh, people don't want to talk to you anymore. Maybe they don't want their kids to play with yours. I mean, it's terrible what happens. So what do people naturally do? They, they try to explain it away. They, they'll say things like, oh my gosh, if I had seen that, in this case, that CVS video, uh, I never would have voted for acquittal. It's only because the court withheld that evidence from me. I was misled by the court. It's not my fault. And they say all kinds of stuff that's just nonsense. And But it's understandable, right? And they're just human beings. They want to live a normal life. They want to be accepted within their cultural group. And uh, so they just they, they say whatever it takes to, to help make that happen. So I, if we hear it, first of all, they're not obligated to say anything. If they do say anything, I, I wouldn't believe it. Another jury question, uh, speculative, but do you think that there was a rogue juror that finally agreed with others or overall a divided jury until the end? No, I, I think it was a rogue juror. I think this talk, first of all, I, I saw the news reports of uh, defense attorney Richards saying he thought it was 6-6. First of all, I don't know that he said that. Um, I don't know what context that was in. That would not be a, a very reasonable perception of events, um, especially for a guy who had been there the whole time, obviously, and had done these pre-trial mock juries. Um, a, a much more reasonable view is that you had a lot of people who were in favor of acquittal. Uh, maybe you had, you, you did have like three, maybe three jurors who were wearing masks the whole time, which is not a good sign, obviously. Uh, and they apparently were sitting together during the deliberations. And then by Tuesday or Wednesday, they were no longer sitting together. So it feels to me like there were three holdouts and then there was two and then there was one. And the one at the end was almost certainly, I think, the jury four person, uh, juror number 54, the one who asked for the jury instructions to take home. Uh, I think she was the last holdout. Frankly, that was Thursday. And I think the other jurors told her, listen, uh, today's Thursday, tomorrow's Friday. Next week is Thanksgiving. Uh, do whatever you need to do to come to an ultimate decision. Take the jury instructions home. But we're coming back here Friday morning and we're either rendering a verdict or it's a mistrial because we're not staying here for Thanksgiving. And she went home, got to, took the jury instructions, tried to find probably a way to uh, be unequivocally in favor of guilt, was unable to do that, and came back and compromised with compromised. I mean, you know, agreed with the others that uh, an acquittal was the only way to go. And so ultimately, that's where we ended up. But I think it, ultimately, at the end of the day, it was it was that one holdout. Okay, this one I think is a really important question because. It seems that there is an overarching theme on the left that they are systematically attacking the right to self-defense. They're attacking the right of property ownership and personal property um, and your ability to defend your personal property, your livelihood, your person. And so someone's asking, what do you think are the broader implications for self-defense cases um, following the Rittenhouse trial? And does it set a legal precedent going forward? Well, it doesn't set a legal precedent in any technical sense. I mean, trial courts don't do that. Precedent only comes from appellate court decisions. 
Um, but I mean, it kind of in uh, socially it does, and and in a social legal sense, arguably it does. Um, so if this had gone the other way, uh, the entire country would have known that hey, if you go out there with a gun in defense of property to stop rioters and looters and arsonists, and God forbid you have to shoot somebody in self-defense, you're going to prison for the rest of your life. So people would have just stayed home. Uh, when when Antifa and uh, the horde shows up to burn your city to the ground, well, that's just what they get to do, apparently. The cops are standing off. No one's coming in to help. There's no fire. There's no EMS. There's no police. There's nothing. And you know you can't do anything because you'll just go to jail for the rest of your life, and that doesn't help anything. Um, I think that's one of the reasons the left felt so strongly about this case, because if Kyle got acquitted, well, that means the opposite then, right? That means we still live in a world where you could be armed and you could have to defend yourself and it could be lawful. Now, the truth is, of course, is Kyle had to go through this process to get there and they could put any of us through that process. Listen, if I had a 17 year old son and he said to me, hey, listen, I'm thinking of going down to the, the, uh, the riots with an AR, I'd say like, hell you are. Uh, that's not happening. Only bad things can come of that, right? And even though Kyle got acquitted, let's face it, only bad things came of this, right? I mean, I don't, I don't, maybe less property got burned. I mean, we had suggestions of that from some of the witness testimony. There were many fewer fires that night than there had been just the night previously. Maybe that was because there were armed people, but that's a very amorphous benefit when we have very concrete costs, right? The concrete costs are people died. Some of them were not very nice people, but nevertheless, people died. Um, and then Kyle had was prosecuted 14 months coming up to this trial and throughout this entire trial till the last moment when the last count was read um, in terms of a verdict. He didn't know if he was going to prison for the rest of his life or much of the rest of his life. Uh, nobody knew with certainty. The defense counsel had their heads in their hands while the verdict was being read. Uh, there was no confidence there that they were going to get an acquittal. So the risks are very high. Um, but a, a lot of the country is going to think, hey, at least he did get acquitted. So if I decide I'm going to be prepared to, you know, be armed and protect property from arsonists, rioters, and looters, okay, that, that's still on the table as an option. The left hates that because, well, I would imagine it's more difficult to recruit people to do things like Joseph Rosenbaum was doing and Anthony Huber was doing and Gage Grosskreutz was doing. And if they think they might actually get shot lawfully uh, by law-abiding people resisting them. So I think in that sense, it's... Uh, it's helpful. I, I would tell people that there's nothing about this case that would keep prosecutor Binger or any other prosecutor from bringing exactly the same charges uh, the next time around. So they'll, they'll, they'll be happy to charge everybody who ends up in a situation that Kyle Rittenhouse found himself in. One thing that I, uh, I think one big takeaway is thankfully we had these independent videographers out there with body cams videoing things and plus somebody affiliated with the Daily Caller. Without that video, you know, I mean, the video showed what actually happened. It would have been one person's word against another or multiple people's words against Kyle. It would have been, you know, then they would have had to call him because there would have been no evidence. Right. So that's yep. it. The other thing that I really took away from it is, you know, we use the word riot, okay? Those videos showed the intensity of the violence that night. I mean, it really is kind of shocking. I mean, uh, Rosenbaum pushing a burning um, dumpster into a police, an occupied police car, you know, uh, but the, it's the intensity of it. You know, these are the so-called mostly peaceful protests. This was extraordinarily intense violence by dozens or hundreds of people. And I think that's the other thing we have to realize. And I think that's why the left doesn't like it, because you had people on the ground showing what was actually happening. It was so interesting. It's, um, you know, in the George Zimmerman trial, <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually quite ironic. There was no video in the George Zimmerman trial, but the police lied to him about there being video. At one point when they were interrogating him, they said, uh, you know, they've been talking to him for hours and he's been claiming self-defense and they, they finally came back and they said, George, we have a real problem with uh, your story because uh, we just discovered a video. We know exactly what happened. And you know what he said? Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Right. Thank God you had video. Because See? he knew that if they had video, it was going to vindicate him. Right. So that that little trap didn't work. By the way, folks, if you don't know, the cops are completely entitled to lie to you about what evidence they have when uh, they're interrogating you. Um, in this case, we had nothing but video. Uh, I mean, if there were three minutes of the night not caught on video by somebody, it was uh, 
a rarity. And it's amazing. And you're right. It's it. I, it was a, absolutely critical to Kyle's defense because, I mean, there were, let's let's face it. There were a lot of shots fired. There were dead people, numerous dead people, numerous wounded people, numerous people shot at and missed. And, you know, the law says, say you had one attacker coming at you. You have a gun. You're shooting in self-defense. The law says you can shoot as many times as you need to to neutralize that threat, assuming the first shot is warranted. All the others are warranted if that's what it takes to neutralize that threat. But you get up much past three, four, five, six rounds, it begins not to look like self-defense anymore just because of the number of rounds that you fired. And maybe they were really necessary, but it doesn't begin to look like it. And if there had been no video, it wouldn't have been that Kyle shot somebody who was attacking him. It would have been he shot this guy, and then he shot this guy, and then he shot this guy, and he tried to shoot that guy. And that's kind of hard to explain away as self-defense, unless you have this video that shows the unbelievable uh, circumstances that compelled him to have to engage in that kind of defensive behavior. So, yeah, he was very, very fortunate. Another similar thing was, you know, they did have video in the Zimmerman case, but it wasn't of the event. It was of Zimmerman doing walkthroughs with police after the event where he was there at the scene and he would point and explain and they were recording him on video. And the prosecution played that video in his trial over and over again. And the I was amazed to me that they would play it because it was like Zimmerman was testifying his de- self-defense narrative over and over again in the state's case without ever having to take the witness stand himself and be subject to cross-examination and impeachment. Um, and I felt much the same way every time the prosecution played a video segment f- purportedly for the purpose of hurting the defense. And I saw that chaos happening. I was like, oh, my God, I, I actually I feel sorry for Ka- this is why he was there, be- because it was absolute chaos. He was there to help people amidst chaos. So I, 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 I thought every time the state showed those videos, it was harmful to the state. Hey, this is about the prosecutor and uh, what punitive actions, if any, should or could be taken against the Rittenhouse prosecution. So, I mean, these kind of sanctions are not my area of expertise, but uh, whatever the greatest sanctions are, are the ones that should be brought. I mean, I I, I don't believe any of their excuses for this behavior. I, I The mere fact that he referenced in front of the jury Kyle's assertion of his Fifth Amendment right to silence, uh, as far as I'm concerned, he should be disbarred for that. There's no excuse for that. Folks, that's not a mere oversight. Uh, a first year a uh, lawyer knows that you just don't not only do you not do that, you don't go anywhere near that. And this is a professional experienced prosecutor. This was not an accident. Uh, frankly, when he did that, I found completely believable the defense argument that they wanted a mistrial with prejudice because this was obviously orchestrated. He was trying to get a mistrial so he could dump this court, dump this judge, dump this jury and get a second bite at the apple. Uh, that's the only reason that he could possibly think it would the only motive he could have for referencing that fifth amendment assertion in front of the jury. And then immediately within minutes, he did it with excluded evidence, the CVS video he started to talk about. And that was evidence the judge had clearly excluded. And the prosecutor says, well, you know, you, you were kind of ambiguous about that. And you know, he's actually right. The judge was kind of ambiguous. The judge was like, well, I'm strongly inclined not to allow it, but I won't make any final decisions until I see how the evidence develops. So equivocal a, a character trait of this judge that I really don't like. But the way you address that as the prosecutor in that circumstance is if you feel the door has been opened to evidence that's so far been excluded, you ask the judge to discuss it. You have the jury excused from the room and you and the defense debate it in front of the judge. And you can say, Your Honor, I think the door has been opened or there's been some new development or there's a there's a legitimate reason to consider no longer excluding this evidence. And then you get it in if the judge agrees. You don't do that in front of the jury without asking the judge first. It, frankly, it's contemptuous of the judge. He should have been held in contempt for that. That was nonsense. And his 20 minute explanation for why he thought it was appropriate was was pathetic. It was like the babbling of a child who got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Uh, Then this nonsense with the drone video and the reduced resolution and and, and the other prosecutor, uh, Krauss, saying, well, I don't really know this IT stuff. And he's got the software on his laptop specifically designed to reduce resolution. And he has a laundry list of 12 reasons why it wasn't his fault. It was everybody else's fault. It was even Binger's fault, his, his colleague prosecutor 
defense fault. It was the secretary's fault. It was Google's fault. It was Dropbox's fault. For someone who doesn't know technology very well, he had a lot of technological reasons for why this wasn't his fault. So I found all of that completely incredible. I mean, at one point, the judge was screaming at the prosecution that the prosecution said, well, I was acting in good faith. The judge screams at him in court. I don't believe you, which means the judge believes he's acting in bad faith. And of course, he was acting in bad faith. Um, it, was, it was completely horrific. And, and the stakes here matter, right? This was not a shoplifting case or DWI case. This was a case where they knew they had no substantive evidence inconsistent with self-defense, but they were trying to win anyway. They were not going for... So the prosecution and the defense are different, folks. The defense, as far as I'm concerned, criminal defense is my side of the fence. I can do anything within the bounds of legal ethics for my client to win. I can be wily and sneaky, and it's the state's job to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They don't have that privilege. Their mission is supposed to be justice, not just a win. And they knew here they were not seeking justice. They knew they were merely seeking a win. They were seeking a conviction based on innuendo and table pounding and a general sense that a 17 year old shouldn't be walking down our streets with an air rifle, regardless of the actual elements of any criminal charge. And that's not the way prosecutions in a non-fascist state are supposed to be run, but they were doing it anyway. Uh, and I find it contemptible. So whatever sanctions they can possibly impose on this crew of, of Binger and Kraus, I will 100% support. But I will tell you, in my experience, nothing happens. I mean, if you want to know how innocent people can be convicted, this is a perfect example. I mean, Kyle may not have had perfect defense counsel, but he had pretty good defense counsel. OK, and he also had the eyes of the world watching, which I think probably helped as well. You put this case in some other court. He's going to jail because of the prosecutor. Same facts. The, these prosecutors were sleazy. Um, they were win at all costs. And unfortunately, while you can't with a broad brush say all prosecutors are like this, there are enough like this that there are a lot of innocent people sitting in jail. And that should be a wake up call um, that you can be in favor of law and order and against prosecutors like Binger. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of prosecutors and most of them are committed civil servants doing a genuinely good job to the best of their abilities, actually seeking justice. But we give prosecutors enormous power and discretion on the premise that that's how they'll use it, seeking justice. But when you give all that power and discretion to someone who's not seeking justice, who's seeking political capital, who's seeking to accomplish a win at any cost for whatever the reasons might be, regardless of justice, you have a monster in the courtroom uh, because there's almost nothing they can't do. We, we don't have any real bars to being dragged into court on charges of murder. We're supposed to. We're supposed to have things like probable cause hearings, grand juries. Those are all rubber stamps for a prosecutor. If you have to defend yourself against a, a, a murderous attacker and you end up shooting and killing that person, you're looking at a murder charge or manslaughter charge unless the prosecutor just decides he doesn't want to do that. But if he decides he wants to, you are going on trial for murder and a potential life sentence. That's just the way it is. There's no The only effective checks we have effective may be too strong a word, nominal checks we have are in states that have self-defense immunity provisions where you can get a pre-trial hearing to kind of have a mini trial to argue out self-defense before you get to the trial itself. Uh, how well those things work, I think opinions vary, frankly, but at least it's an option uh, in those states that have self-defense self immunity provisions. Uh, Florida's is pretty good and they keep making it stronger. Uh, but on the other hand, they keep making it stronger because the judges won't apply it properly <laughs> the way the legislator intended. Uh, so it's it's very much a, a double edged sword. And the legal community is not accustomed to these pretrial immunity hearings. They, they per, if you're the judge or the prosecutor, you want things to go to trial. I mean, you're in the courtroom anyway. That's it's not like it's a burden. That's where you're going to be regardless of any particular case. That's where you work. Uh, so they don't want an easy what they see as an easy out for the defense. And the net result is that if they want to bring you to trial on murder, there's effectively no bar. And there you are. And you're in court. And you're at stake is the rest of your life, whether you'll spend it in a cage. Uh, and you better hope that 
you're, the facts are good for you and you better hope you have a good legal defense because if you've given your lawyer, listen, we all like to think, I hear this all the time. Hey, if, I, if I'm involved in the use of force event, well, I'll, I'll hire a lawyer. The lawyer will take care of it. That's what they're supposed to do. And listen, I appreciate the vote of confidence, but the truth is your lawyer is stuck with the facts you give him. And if you give him bad facts, if your use of force was actually outside the legal boundaries, there's not a lot your lawyer is going to be able to do for you. By the same token, if you give him good facts, but your lawyer is weak, well, you know, innocent people go to jail. So you need both. You need good facts and you need really good legal counsel. Um, and unfortunately, that's a challenge for most people because most lay people, they're, they're not equipped to know whether or not their legal counsel is any good. They're, they're just not. Uh, I wish I had a good solution to that. I mean, one thing we do all the time is people call our office and say, hey, do you know a lawyer here or there? And I usually do know somebody I can recommend, but it's not like I know every lawyer in the country or a lawyer in every jurisdiction. These are just personal relationships. Um, I, I think there's a market opportunity out there, Bill, if you care to, to set up kind of referral system for, uh, it's beyond <laughs> my capabilities, but uh, it would be invaluable, I think. Okay, so this is, um, I think, a really important question about the definition of provocation. And it says, is provocation determined objectively based on what the person claiming self-defense actually did or subjectively based on what the attacker who was killed by the defendant claiming self-defense thought was a danger presented by the defendant? Well, it's a, it's not enough for the person just to claim some kind of provocation. It would have to be something that would be objectively reasonable. You can't say you're, you have a, you know, if you have a phobia of, I don't know, baseball caps or something that obviously someone's wearing a baseball cap, that wouldn't be provocative behavior. But more importantly, one, one of the really dishonest things the prosecution did, and maybe they don't know. I mean, most lawyers don't know this area of the law very well, but they were suggesting that there was provocation could be this kind of some kind of generalized conduct, like just showing up wearing a rifle was provocation, right? That provoked the violence. If he, in fact, Binger said this, if he just hadn't shown up with a gun, none of this would have happened, right? But that's not how provocation works in use of force law. So we have provocation as a word in normal English, and we use it all the time, and it is generalized and broad and it can mean all kinds of things. But in terms of use of force law, in terms of whether you've lost the privilege of self-defense, provocation has a very specific meaning. It has to be associated with an immediate forcible response because that's what it's explaining away. So someone uses force or threatens force against you. The question is, can you lawfully defend yourself against it? The answer might be no, because you provoked it. But prov provocation that does not result in an immediate forcible response is irrelevant for use of force purposes, because if there's no forcible response, there's nothing you're defending yourself against. There is no self-defense incident to begin with. And when Kyle was wearing the rifle, there, every, lots of people were wearing rifles, and nobody else had, was subject to attack. He wore a rifle all night. He wasn't subject to attack until he was isolated in that, in that parking lot. So it's not that wearing the rifle was immediately provoking a violent response from people. That's not what was happening. So that could not have been the provocation. Now, the prosecution tried to argue he pointed the rifle at, they, they wouldn't even say the Zeminskis. They would say an individual. But that provoked Rosenbaum to attack uh, Kyle uh, as a defense of others kind of scenario. That was the state's argument at the end with this magically discovered drone video footage. And that would be a, a scenario in which if you believed he pointed the rifle, that could have been a provocation that resulted in an immediate forcible response. Um, but you had to believe that that video and that image showed you him doing that. And frankly, I'm, I don't think it did. Um, I don't think you could see anything out of those. But all the other stuff, all the kind of generalized conduct, the crossing state lines, the having the gun, uh, none of that is provocation in this in a use of force sense that loses you self-defense because none of that resulted in an immediate forcible response. Uh, this has to do with a charge against Rittenhouse's friend, Dominic Black, and whether or not uh, Rittenhouse's acquittal will have any impact on that pending charge. Well, no, not the acquittal. I mean, they're completely unrelated charges, really, right? So um, what, what Dominic is charged with is providing a gun to a minor where the gun ends up being used uh, and a death results is my paraphrase of that statute. 
Um, and that all happened here, arguably. Uh, so I, I think Dominic may well be out of luck. Now, I think his defense attorney now is going to argue that, well, that statute's intended to apply to unlawful killings. It's not intended to apply to lawful killings. There was no unlawful killing here. We know that because Rittenhouse got uh, acquitted. So that's certainly an argument I would make. But the statute doesn't say that. It doesn't have that word was used in an unlawful killing. It just says a death results. Um, so you'd have to address it. Certainly, you know, if you end up going to trial, you, you would argue for that inclusion in the jury instructions. And by the way, the, a, a similar issue arose with the um, the gun possession jury instruction. So when you read that, uh, Rittenhouse was charged with unlawful gun possession because he was a, a minor in possession of that AR rifle. Um, and if you look at the actual statute that controls that, it's a little convoluted. You have to read this statute and then there's an exception and you have to read another statute and maybe a third statute. But if you do that work and you do the statutory construction, the statutory interpretation, I mean, I did that analysis a week after the shootings occurred, and it was obvious to me this gun statute didn't apply to Kyle. He was exempt because of the various conditions and exclusions built into the statutory language. It should never have been charged. And once charged at the first court hearing, it should have been dismissed. I mean, it's ridiculous that it was in place through the trial, I mean, all the way up until the, the day the jury was instructed, the, it's only then that the judge finally got rid of that gun possess, possession charge. But it was a it was a little bit um, convoluted, but nevertheless didn't apply. Uh, in the case of Dominic, oh, but the jury instruction for that gun possession charge did not reflect the statutory language. The jury instruction didn't say, all right, if you're 18, uh, if you're 17 and have a gun, you're guilty unless you meet these exceptions. That's what the statutory language said. The jury instruction only said, if you're under 18 and you have the gun, you're guilty. So if the jury had been given that standardized jury instruction, they would have found guilty. I mean, that would have been all they, they don't get the statute. They only get the jury instruction. Um, and during the jury instruction conference, uh, the defense got the additional exemption language put in. And it was at that point that the judge finally dismissed that charge because Everyone in the room realized, all right, well, if this is what the jury is going to be told, there's actually no facts in dispute. I mean, he was under 18. He did have a rifle, but the rifle was not a short barreled rifle, which is one, one way to get in trouble. And uh, the hunting provisions he was supposedly not in compliance with don't apply to 17 year olds. So you can't not be in compliant with a statute that doesn't apply to you. There was no rational reading of this jury instruction now that could result in guilt. And that's why they, the judge ultimately, I mean, he should have known that 14 months earlier, but nevertheless, that's where he got it then. Um, with, the, with the gun possession charge, I mean, with the gun uh, provision charge that Dominic is facing, you know, I mean, if the jury is going to be instructed, hey, if he provided the gun and the gun was used in a death, that, that's not a hard conviction. I, I don't think anybody can test those things. I guess he could try to argue that he didn't give Kyle the gun, that Kyle took the gun, but they drove to town together. Kyle obviously had the gun, so I think it would be difficult. Will uh, Rittenhouse be looking at any civil charges? Is there any buzz about any of that? And if if so, um, this one has a con contingency, if so, would he have to take the stand... Um, since he took the stand in this case, or could he plead the fifth? Oh, okay. So, so there wouldn't be any, yeah, civil charges. Someone, someone would file a civil complaint. Uh, it would be, of course, for Gross Cruz, it would be his arm injury. For the others, it would be a wrongful death suit for Huber and Rosenbaum. Um, I don't believe anything's been filed against him, and I wouldn't expect anything to, to tell you the truth. It's, uh, for one thing, any civil suit is really going to be focused on um, that particular claimed harm, right? So Gross Cruz will be talking about me, my arm, uh, Rosenbaum's family are talking about the shooting of Rosenbaum as isolated events. Uh, that's very different than the what the prosecution got to do. The prosecution got to build this narrative of all these things kind of being connected. Everything flowed together. Uh, if you believe the Rosenbaum shooting was bad, everything else was bad too. It was kind of this overall badness uh, scenario. Uh, but if you look at each event in isolation, they're clearly self-defense. I mean, Gross Cruz was running up on Kyle with a gun in his hand. Uh, if you strip out all the other stuff and you're just looking at that, which is what I would expect to happen in a civil suit, 
well, that's Kyle acting in self-defense every day of the week. And I, I think the same with the others. Um, also, arguably, Kyle has countersuits he could file, right? I mean, he suffered harm from these other people's conduct. So I think it gets very messy very quick. And I, frankly, I think these people have other more promising civil suit targets and cases they've already filed in civil court, uh, mostly, of course, against the city of Kenosha and various arms of the city, like the, like the police. Uh, they're suing them for a lot of money in, in state and federal court. Uh, and I think that's the smart play for them. I mean, the city has a lot of money. Uh, the city has uh, not only a lot of money, but it's other people's money, right? It's not the politician's personal money. It's taxpayer money. Uh, and there's nothing politicians like so much as being able to make political problems and legal problems go away by spending other people's money. So they tend to be very amenable to making rich settlements on these kinds of claims. It doesn't mean anything that happened was wrong. It means the easiest path out of a painful position for that politician is to give away $20 million of somebody else's money. So that's what they do. They did it with Jacob Blake. Uh, they do it with uh, in the Chauvin trial. They, they do it in all these cases. So it's, it, it's, and it's got nothing to do with legal merit. It's got to do with uh, politicians being able to make their pain go away by spending other people's money. But I, I don't really expect Kyle to find himself civilly sued. Um, I, interestingly enough, Wisconsin does have a self-defense immunity statute, but it, it's so uh, narrowly defined that he doesn't qualify for its benefits. I just did a blog post about that minutes before we went on the air. Bill, I don't know if you want that one. I'll send it your way. You can decide if you want to uh, uh, publish it over at Legal Insurrection too. Um, but I, I don't think he's in any serious difficulty over that. I would be surprised if he found himself facing a bunch of lawsuits. Uh, but having said that, all these people who think he's going to make millions suing over defamation, forget it. That's not happening either. I'm sure that's in the questions, right? Somebody must have asked about that. Because uh, we all think about Nick Sandman, who, uh, Sandman, however you pronounce his name, who got all that money. Um, that's not the position Kyle is in. Um, Kyle was indicted and charged, brought to trial. Um, so anything associated with that is going to be fair game. The courts invariably say, hey, people are reading in the paper that he's on trial for murder. They're calling him a murderer. That's just how people talk. Uh, we're, we're not going to let you sue for defamation over anything having to do with the trial itself. And in terms of all the, these, uh, and, and Bill mentioned all these places, MSNBC and, and so forth, it's even ESPN. I mean, a sports network. Some, for some reason, they find this is appropriate content for a sports network. Um, but they're calling him, you know, white supremacist and militia and all this kind of stuff. And of course, is I don't know if there's anything worse in America you can be called than a racist. I mean, that's about as bad as it gets. But the courts consistently say that it's it's generalized enough that they they just don't let you sue for defamation over it. Uh, so there there may be some narrow, little specific spots where particular in, individuals conducted themselves so egregiously. But even then, how do you how do you how do you get to damages? I mean, how do you make your damages concrete when you're also a person who people can call you a white supremacist, racist murderer? I mean, you're pretty damaged already, right? <laughs> At that point, uh, what some other individual might have done in particular, I, I think it would be, be very difficult to quantify. So I think what we might see is we might see, uh, how can I put it? Uh, we might see a lot of email solicitations for money for the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse fund to help him defend against uh, or help him fund these defamation lawsuits. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me. It's a, it's a way to make money and people like ways to make money. So I wouldn't surprise be surprised if we start getting those kind of emails in our email boxes. Uh, I will tell you that the prospects of him getting any money in any kind of defamation suit is, is essentially zero. That's so if you, if you contribute money to those efforts, you're just giving money to who's whoever is sending right. out those emails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whoever's raising the money in most cases. Um, <clears throat> Wisconsin is not a stand your ground state, but follows the castle doctrine. What were the implications with duty to retreat here? Wisconsin is a stand your ground state. So sorry. <laughs> uh, there, there's no generalized legal duty to retreat in Wisconsin. In fact, the jury instruction on self-defense explicitly says that there's no duty to retreat. Uh, but it's what I call a soft stand your ground state. So there's no legal duty. You don't automatically lose self-defense if you didn't retreat. But the jury is allowed to consider whether retreat was possible safely 
and whether a reasonable person would have done so. And if safe retreat was possible and they decided it was unreasonable, well, then your use of force was unreasonable and you can lose self-defense on that basis. But it's not a state like New York or Massachusetts or Maryland where there's an absolute legal duty to retreat if possible. Uh, there is no legal duty to retreat in, in Wisconsin. Castle Doctrine, people misunderstand Castle Doctrine. Uh, Castle Doctrine only applies um, in your home. Uh, if, you would if you would have had a duty to retreat out on the street in front of your home, when you're in your home, you're relieved of that duty to retreat. Um, none of that is relevant here because, of course, nothing that Kyle did was done in his home. So, This is a good uh, general question. Um, not sure how you want to handle this or if you want to answer it, what are you permitted to do if your property is being destroyed? Well, you can use non-deadly force to defend your property. Uh, I generally recommend against it. I don't think the uh, the risks are worth it. Uh, there's very little property that's worth, worth going to jail for the rest of your life. And the trouble is when you start lawfully using non-deadly force in defense of property, it's very easy for that situation to escalate to the point where now you find it necessary to use deadly force. And then the question will always be, well, did you use deadly force really to defend your life or did you use deadly force to defend that piece of property? And what qualifies as a quote unquote use of deadly force can become contextual. So there are states there are states where it's only a use of deadly force if you fire the weapon, okay? That's pretty explicit. That's a very bright line test right there. But there are other states, I can tell you in Massachusetts, if you sweep back your jacket so someone can see your gun in the holster, you have to meet the same legal standard as if you'd shot that person for that conduct to be justified. Uh, so merely trying to use a weapon as a deterrent can get you in tremendous legal trouble. Uh, so my personal position, and folks, I'm, I'm a guy who carries a gun for personal protection. I have my entire adult life. I will never threaten to use any degree of force in defense of any piece of property. There's no piece of property that's worth that legal peril to me. Once it becomes a matter of threat to persons, different ball game. Um, but there's no piece of property I've ever possessed or possessed today that's worth me risking any possibility of going to prison for the rest of my life, or for that matter, having to kill somebody. Right. So um, in the interest of time, do we have closing thoughts? Um, Bill, do you want to go? And then Andrew, and then I can wrap us up. And before we do that real quickly, I want to apologize. I know a lot of you received your login instructions after the event began. We're not sure why that is. I will find out to ensure that does not happen again. Um, because they were sent out well before the event. So I don't know if that was just our email platform that was slow in releasing some of those, but I want to apologize for the trouble that that caused some of y'all in logging in and remind you that we will be reposting this because this is recorded. So if you missed a little bit of the beginning, we'll make sure that you get um, the opportunity to see the full program. So uh, one thing I should mention, I do have a hard stop at seven o'clock. I have another media thing but until then i'm free so i'm not in a hurry to get off it's it's up to you guys it's your show whatever you want to do but uh, don't don't close early on my behalf uh, i will say i see a comment here in the chat saying well texas allows for deadly force to protect property if it's true texas has a statute that allows it's the only state that does this there are circumstances in which texas will allow you to use deadly force in defense of property if anybody wants to read it you can find it at lawofselfdefense.com slash 942 because it's penal code section 942. That's how often I get this issue come up that I've set up a special URL just for it. If you read that statute, you will see an unbelievable complex of conditions that have to be met. Lots of reasonableness conditions, not of not possible by any other means conditions. These are all judgment calls that are going to be made by other people, by a, a police, by prosecutors, by jurors, not you. What you decided what reasonable, what was reasonable is not what's going to control your legal fate, whether you go to prison. It's other people's judgment. And if you think it's prudent over a piece of property to trust 12 other people not to put you in prison for the rest of your life because somebody was, what, stealing your car or whatever. Now, we're talking personal property here, not a home. That's completely different. Uh, I, I think you're taking a lot of risk for something that's probably replaceable. And a few decades in prison is not replaceable. Uh, 
Uh, how many Brady violations were committed? So for those who don't know, Brady violations are um, circumstances where the court, uh, where the prosecution had evidence that was exculpatory for the defense, was favorable to the defense, and they didn't give it to the defense. Um, the, the prosecution is supposed to provide all that exculpatory evidence to the uh, defense as part of discovery, and sometimes they don't, or sometimes they kind of do. Like in the Zimmerman case I, I recounted earlier, where they they buried this Brady evidence in the in the depths of a DVD um, that they knew very well the defense was not going to be able to search and find and decode with special software. Uh, in this particular case, in Rittenhouse, they. I would argue they committed a Brady violation when they provided a low resolution version of this video um, at the very least then, uh, because again, it's like giving someone, you have a 12 page document, you give them three pages of it. Well, if you have a, a video of resolution a hundred and you give them a video of resolution 25, you haven't given them the actual evidence as far as I'm concerned, especially when the evidence is supposed to be pivotal to your narrative of the case. This is the evidence that proves provocation. Uh, I think those are all Brady violations. And and I personally have, as you might expect, being on the criminal defense side, a zero tolerance policy here. Uh, there sh this should be strict liability. The state knows what its obligation is. The state has the resources to meet that obligation. If they don't, it should be presumed that they fail to do it for malicious purposes. There's no excuse for this at all. Uh, frankly, it should automatically be a dismissal with prejudice. There's no reason for this to happen. Uh, the notion that they didn't know is, is ridiculous to me. Um, and frankly, it's, it's, it's just outrageous. Again, given the stakes, an 18 year old going in prison for the rest of his life, you, you don't get to be sloppy with the, with the Brady evidence under those circumstances. Um, so I think it's simply inexcusable, but it, it even goes beyond the resolution, right? I mean, that point where they said, they told the whole, they told the court, oh, this drone video just showed up on our doorstep midway through the trial. But the person who provided the drone video was on the witness list for weeks before the trial. Why was his name on the witness list if they didn't know about the video? What other purpose did that person have to be a witness? I would suggest there was none. So I would suggest they knew they had the video. They just held it back until midway through the trial, which means, of course, they withheld Brady evidence until that point. And there are not sanctions strong enough. So at, at that juncture, I do think we were going to go ahead and, and wrap it up. If you have any closing thoughts... Um, and we'll go ahead and start with you, Andrew, and then we'll go to Professor Jacobson, and I will close us out. I guess I would say my concern here is, again, that I see no disincentive for prosecutors to keep doing this. I think we need something like a Kyle's Law. In fact, just this weekend, I was working late, and I actually set up a web page on our site, Kyle's Law. Listen, I'm not a guy who's going to get legislation passed. I'm just a small-town lawyer, but... We're, we're just interested in bringing people together, building some community around this notion of holding prosecutors responsible. So we're not asking for any money or anything, uh, but if people would like to contribute their email so they can be kept informed of this, uh, basically it, it says if, if the case was so far short of ever being able to prove guilt that there ought to be sanctions for the prosecutor, if it's obviously a politically motivated prosecution, if people want to learn more about that, they can go to lawofselfdefense.com slash Kyle's Law just one word. Um, and hopefully we can build some community and get some of this addressed because otherwise we're all vulnerable to this. Any one of us, because we don't get to choose the time, place, and manner of being attacked, right? The attacker comes to us and we could find ourselves the victim of an attack, defend ourselves lawfully, and then be put through a year, 14 months, 18 months of hell and expense and hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost destroying everything we've ever accumulated in our lives to be acquitted at the end. But you don't get any of that back. They've destroyed you. And there ought to be a price to pay for that. Completely agree. And thank you so much for doing that. We'll ensure that um, we include that link um, when we republish this, because we will republish this once it's ready to go. Uh, I know we'll have a lot of questions about that and a lot of interest in how people can be involved in that. And Professor Jacobson? I guess my closing comments are one, I want to thank Andrew for doing this blogging for us and for all his mm -hmm. input over the years. I mean, going back to the Zimmerman case, 2000, July 2013, um, and we hope he'll come back again for future cases. Um, just like you can't pick when you're attacked, we can't 
choose when there's going to be a big self-defense case. They happen when they happen, um, but it's something we try to bring to the readership and uh, which is a little different than other places um, where you might get five minutes here, 10 minutes there, you get all day. So we appreciate that. And I think, again, uh, we have a really difficult problem in this country, which is that so many things are manipulated and you cannot trust the media. They're part of the manipulation. And I think a lot of people are waking up to that. Maybe a lot of people who were not awakened to it uh, just a few years ago or people, you know, uh, just reading commentary. This was a wake up call for a lot of people, people that the media lies to you. They lie to you every single day. They do it without conscience and they do it for political purposes. And they are in cahoots with the activists who want to turn simple cases of did somebody violate into violate the law into huge social justice issues. Uh, and that taints everything. So I'm glad that this was the outcome here. It was the proper outcome here. Uh, and I'm glad that, but they're still out there. They're still foaming at the mouth. They're still telling lies. Um, and fortunately this one turned out the right way. Before we go, I do want to add one more thing, folks. When I cover these trials, I literally watch every minute of the trial, every minute of the pretrial hearings, everything that's broadcast, I watch. And these days, fortunately, most of these cases are broadcast. My days usually start at 5 a.m. and around 10 or 11 p.m. by the time I'm doing the analysis and the video and the podcast and all that kind of stuff. There's no way I would be able to do that without the support of legal insurrection. It would be absolutely impossible. Uh, so for those of you who enjoy the coverage I provided these cases, legal insurrection is what makes it possible for me to provide that kind of coverage. So thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous help. Yeah, and thank you so much for your coverage. It's always so informative. I always learn so much, and I, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do what you do. I know it's a tremendous help for thousands of people <laughs> who jump on to read the work that you're doing. And as always, I have to take my two minutes here to just remind everyone that you can you can make a difference. And that if you are looking for someone to swoop in and save you from what we're dealing with both politically and culturally right now, it's not going to happen. It, it's just not. That What I can say to give you hope is that you're not alone. There are tons of people out there and it might look like we are a minority here. I don't believe that's true um, in terms of just trying to speak the truth. I mean, we saw what the narrative was with this particular case and how the facts were egregiously misrepresented by every major media outlet. We do the best we can with the platform that we have to tell the truth and to ensure that the facts as we know them are presented and the most accurate way possible. Um, but if you're looking for someone to save you, that's just not gonna happen. It is up to you to get involved in your local governments, to get involved in your local communities, to get involved in school boards, to get involved in any way you possibly can to help change things because you cannot leave it to anyone else. You are the someone else. And that said, we are all happy warriors. We are all fighting the good fight. We're doing everything we can. And I want you to know that you're not alone. And if you do feel like you're alone, email me. We are always here, literally always here. We joke about this, but we work all day, every day, all night. So if, if you need any help or support, if you're feeling discouraged, know that you're not alone. And we are here with you. We'll do everything we can to support you, to connect you to other people. Um, we've had the privilege over the years and the longer we do this, the more people we meet, we do a lot of connecting behind the scenes so that we can help plug people in with other people who are doing the hard work to stand up against what's just outright lies to people who have done nothing wrong that just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time or people who were just asking a question like um can you please tell me what your what curriculum you're using to teach my kindergartner and then they end up being threatened with a lawsuit for asking questions and trying to find out exactly what's happening at the school so this is what we do it's not just our job this is definitely a mission this is a um reason to be for us and so uh, just keep the faith, don't give up, but you gotta fight back. You cannot leave it to other people. You can't leave it to um, people with a platform or a microphone. 
when you can get out there in your sphere and every everything you can do to make a difference makes a difference. So don't underestimate small steps um, and the power that those have on a larger scale. So with that, I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. I wanna to thank Professor Jacobson, um, who is a fearless leader in so many ways and who I appreciate and, and have such tremendous admiration for and Andrew for the work that he continues to do in this space and in this sphere who does it better than anyone else. And it's just always a privilege to host you and to be able to publish your work. So we thank y'all uh, for joining us. We will say good night and we will see you on the blog. Y'all take care.